Good afternoon, I'm Chris Cooney. I'm president of the Metro South Chamber of Commerce. It is my pleasure to welcome you here to the Chamber's 104th annual meeting. We hope that you've had an opportunity to visit the expo floor and say hello to many of our business owners that are here and letting you know about their new products and their offerings. We also hope that you had time to check in at the uh, photo booth courtesy of Fun Enterprises where you can get your photo taken in an old time general store including Penny's Market, Brockton's own version of a, a little community general store which is right on Belmont Street. It's been there for 102 years. You can also get your photo taken with one of your favorite sports teams or in a holiday setting if you prefer. I'm just going to ask people that. You may have uh, noticed the balloons and bags sponsored by American Express Small Business Saturday. This coming Saturday, November 25th, there will be a Brockton holiday parade which will fe feature Santa, but you'll also see many of the small business merchants uh, touting the Small Business Saturday logo. So we hope you'll get out and spend some money locally on Saturday, November 25th. We are at near capacity, so if you have a seat at your table, please raise a hand, your hand and let someone know you have a spot. You can make a new friend, maybe a new business acquaintance, maybe issue a loan or get a new business. <laughs> also at this time, I ask everyone right now to take the bag, your bag, your gift bag, at the center of your table and put it underneath you. This will help the servers uh, come in and provide enough space for them to bring food to you. I would now ask that uh, we rise to salute our nation's flag and now to sing our national anthem and lead us in singing God Bless America afterwards and we hope you will all join us. Please join me in welcoming the Cardinal Spellman High School Cabaret a cappella group led by Tim Gannon.
Tim, I don't know how you do it every year. You bring the students out, and uh, every year the talent gets better. So I just drive the bus. <laughs> <laughs> Congratulations. Very proud of you. Thank, Thank you. you. At this time, please join me in a moment of silence as we honor our service men and women for their dedication and enduring service to our country. Thank you. We have a very full agenda, so please continue with your salads and your meal as we continue with the program. Now I'd like to thank our largest sponsors for today's event. Uh, I ask our sponsors to stand and be recognized. Uh, first, from Crescent Credit Union, our premier sponsor, uh, Vice President of Marketing, Jonah Ween, and Richard Hook from Commercial Services. Crescent team, right here in front of me. Thank you. And our major sponsor, to my right, uh, UMass Dunahoo Institute, under the leadership of Lynn Griesmeer and John Murray, Director of Career Works. Thank you very much. In addition, we have some elected and appointed officials with us today. Please give us a wave as I announce your name. I'm very pleased to uh, report the uh, re-election of our mayor, Bill Carpenter, and he is here with us today. Bill can give us a uh, wave. In addition, uh, Ann Beauregard, city councilor, uh, Ward 5, has been re-elected. She's in the corner there. Ann. Troy Clarkson, Hanover Town Manager, is with us, as well as Carl Kowalski from the Whitman Selectmen and Frank Lyman, the Whitman Town Administrator. We're also delighted to have Dick Dalton with us from Massachusetts Office of Business Development. Let's have a round of applause for all of them. We thank so many of our past chairs of the board and directors and economic development partners who are here today and who have been with us uh, year in and year out working with us to better the economy and the community. I would also like to remind you that uh, raffle tickets benefiting the Chambers Education Foundation are on sale right now. I know uh, the staff and volunteers going around. I see uh, Janice and, and Athena there. Uh, we encourage you to uh, purchase a raffle ticket. We have 11 prizes today with stuff like Patriots uh, signed footballs. We have uh, gift cards uh, galore. Uh, and it's just a great uh, fundraiser for our Education Foundation. Um, so please see one of the volunteers who are coming around from table to table. Again, it is my pleasure to welcome you to the Metro South Chamber of Commerce annual meeting. Uh, we thank you for coming out today to, in support of the Chamber and the Metro South region. As Henry Ford once said, coming together is a beginning, keeping together is progress, working together is true success. Today we reflect on our Chamber's progress, celebrate our achievements as a business community, and look towards a bright future of community connectivity and prosperity. Remember that word, connectivity. Later today, we will be reminded of the importance of connectivity as our guest speaker, Ted Reinstein, discusses how New England general stores became the heart of a community here in New England and, and today uh, continue on after shaping early commerce in New England. According to Reinstein, general stores exist in a third place where people can gather easily, inexpensively, and regularly. As Scott Cole, owner of the Massachusetts Monterey General Store says, people really long to be connected to a community. And Karen Pritchard, uh, owner of uh, Wilbur's General Store in Little Compton, Rhode Island says, uh, the store is really a community center uh, in a way, a way that I like, and so does the community. In early New England, the general store was just one of a few places where people could come together to connect with each other, share information, exchange ideas, and learn about the latest products and services. Today, we hope that you see the Chamber as helping to fulfill that role here in this community. Later today, we will also celebrate local business leaders and companies for their shared contribution to the economic vitality of the region many of them investing more than a million dollars in their property just within the last year, literally uh, adding hundreds of jobs to the local economy. But first, the Chamber is very fortunate to have uh, the positive leadership of Jerry Nadeau as our Chair of the Chamber. Please join me in welcoming Jerry Nadeau, President of Rockland Trust Company. Thank you, Chris. 
and thank all of you fellow chamber members for joining us here today on this beautiful, cool, crisp New England day. The chamber has a lot to celebrate this year as we reflect on another successful year, none of which could be accomplished without the joint effort, influence, and guidance of our members. In this past year alone, the chamber has hosted over 70 programs, including Business After Hours, A Taste of Metro South, and a Multicultural Business Forum. We become the place for face-to-face -face by connecting people with the tools, resources, and referrals they need to succeed. The Chamber has also connected members to elected officials to advance our common legislative agenda, hosted a mayoral forum, and advocated for change on the behalf of businesses. The Chamber testified in Brockton and Avon for lower commercial tax rates and urged a freeze on water sewer rates. The Chamber also advocated for the expansion of the Middleborough Lakeville commuter rail line to the south coast and approved a resolution in support of the downtown enterprise parking garage. The Chamber met with Metro South town officials and the Mayor of Brockton to discuss water and sewer issues affecting our region. A permit was announced allowing Brockton to open new sewer connection with these towns. The Chamber also convened a focus group of Brockton CFOs and business leaders to assist with analyzing the cost and benefits of infrastructure investment. The Chamber assisted over 160 businesses in their goals to expand and relocate within the region through consolidation, referrals, con excuse me, consultation, excuse me, referrals and marketing. Projects that the Chamber aided represent an investment of hundreds of millions of dollars in the creation of hundreds of jobs. <clears throat> The Chamber also welcomed 14 new businesses to the region with ribbon cutting ceremonies. In addition, the Chamber hosted more than 21 workshops and offered consulting to over 300 clients within the Chamber's Business Assistance Center. The Chamber completed a land use study of the 65 acre Brockton Fairgrounds to provide a foundation upon which the owners can work with the city to develop the land to its fullest potential. The Chamber continues to distribute this report widely, as well as a regional water and sewer study, CSX rail yard land use study, and Metro South branding study. The Chamber advanced the region's workforce through sponsorship of various youth career days and participated in STEM resource panels, as well as the Regional Workforce Skills Planning Initiative. We also partnered on important employer surveys and promoted the Greater Brockton Young Professionals Program. The Chamber kicked off a South, Metro South Wellness Works program to create healthy, happy, and productive workers and work spaces leading to greater employee retention. Components included healthy lunch sessions and downtown Brockton wellness walks to promote downtown businesses and generate additional foot traffic. This year, the Chamber also marketed downtown Brockton through newly redesigned Brockton information boards placed throughout the city. We continue to promote the Metro South region through maps, advertisements, and publications featuring our brand. When Metro South is home, everything is within reach. Finally, the Metro South Chamber Board of Directors recently convened for a full day of planning to set priorities for next year and beyond at our board retreat. We analyzed our current mission, values, and goals, and how we must adapt to stay relevant in this age of digital media and shifting demographics. We derived a pivot point in how we approach our value proposition. We realized that the connection with our members and between our members is what sets us apart. By working with you, supporting you, and providing opportunities for you, we will improve the economic vitality and the quality of the life within the Metro South region. More information will be released on our priorities shortly. However, you can expect a closer eye to inclusive leadership and membership that reflects one of the region's greatest assets, our diversity. You can also expect the Chamber to be your adaptive resource that serves all sizes and varieties of businesses, provides more opportunities for engagement and shared perspectives, and serves as a convener for public discussion on key issues. Through these principles, we will capitalize on mutually beneficial opportunities and be positioned to respond to common challenges as a unified business voice within the region. Once again, thank you for your support as an engaged business community. At this time, I am pleased to present the report of the nominating committee for 2017. The slate was officially elected at the October Board of Directors meeting. 
I ask those present to stand as I call your name and remain standing till all are introduced. And if you, I may, please hold your applause to the end so we can do it at once. Nominated and elected to the class of 2018, Jenny Mather, JM Pet Resort, Albert Senesi, Victory Human Services, Matt Osborne, Eastern Bank, Lisa Stratum, Wicked Local Enterprise News, George Spilios, Crown Linen. Nominated and elected to the class of 2019, Kim Holland, Signature Healthcare, Nelson Fernandez, JJ's Cafe, Jay Pike, Shikansky LLP, CPAs. Nominated and elected to the class of 2020, Greg Hart, Cone Resnick, CPAs. Friend Weiler, Consultant. Jason Barboza, Vicentes. Richard Hines, Barber Corporation. Ray Ledoux, Brockton Area Transport. Andrew Ronska, Abington Bank. Joe Casey, Harbor One Bank. I'd like to ask that all additional member, Metro South Chamber board members in attendance to please rise at this time. Please join me in a round of applause for all their service. Thank you. The following will serve as offices. I ask each of them to stand as I read their names and remain standing till all are introduced. Again, I ask you to please hold your applause. Chairman, myself, Jerry Nato. President and CEO, Chris Cooney. Chair-elect, Fred Clark. Treasurer, Greg Hart, CPA. Vice Chair, Economic Development, Pat Chimarella. Vice Chair, Membership Development, Fred Weiler. Vice Chair, Community Affairs, Masa Kambavi. Vice Chair, Government Affairs, Ray Ledoux. Past Chairman, Sue Joss. Please give me a round of applause. A special part of our annual meeting is the presentation of recognition awards. I ask Chamber President Chris Cooney to join me in presenting these awards. Our first presentation honors board members who are completing their maximum years of service on the board. Please join us on the stage when your name is called. First, Fran Dillon, Stonehill College, Jane Callahan, HR Alternatives, and Peter Neville, Concord Foods. Thank you, Fran, Jane, and Peter. Our next presentation honors those who have earned the 2017 Metro South Economic Impact Award. Today, we honor 11 companies who have made a significant economic impact in the region, creating jobs and adding to the rich business culture provided by providing valuable products, resources, and services to help our region thrive. Combined, these businesses have invested more than $73 million and created more than 360 jobs. Each award recipient and their accomplishments are detailed in your program. I ask each recipient, as I call your name, to come forward and remain on stage for a group photo. The Metro South Chamber of Commerce is pleased to present the Economic Impact Award to the first six recipients, accepting on behalf of Barrett's Alehouse West Bridgewater is Bruce Hughes of OCPC. We have the Beanery on Washington with Wendy Chambers. Harbor Health is Charles Jones. Copeland Chevrolet, Todd Copeland. McDonald's is Carol Chin. And Signature Healthcare is Kim Holland. Let's join in round of applause.
The Chamber is pleased to present the Economic Impact Award to the next five recipients. Accepting on behalf of JJ's Cafe is Nelson Fernandez. The Children's Workshop is Amanda Miller. Union Point is Stephen Crawl. Woodcraft Designers and Builders is Maycheck Bukovich, sorry. And Workspace at 45 is Pat Chimarella of Old Colony Planning Council. Join me in a round of applause. Our final recognition award is the Charles A. Fuller Memorial Chamber Award. The late Mr. Fuller had served as chairman of the board for the chamber and was very dedicated to our organization and the community. This award recognizes an individual whose leadership, performance, personal example, and good influence has done the most to advance the welfare of the Metro South Chamber of Commerce and its communities. This year's recipient is Bob Wisgerda. Give me a round of applause. Bob's roots within the Brockton and Chamber community span decades. Bob began his professional career in 1960 when he managed a family-owned Brockton pharmacy. He earned his degree in pharmacy from the Massachusetts College of Pharmacy. He continued working in that industry before becoming a marketing specialist for WXBR Radio AM 1460 in Brockton. Most recently, he has been a host on Hometown Talk Radio AM 1530 WVBF and has started his own marketing consulting company, Metro South Media Resources. Bob joined the chamber in 1982 and the ambassador team in 1999. He's been one of the greatest advocates for the chamber. His volunteering efforts, especially during the annual Taste of Metro South, have been instrumental to the success of many chamber programs. In the community, Bob has served as the president of the Massachusetts Lions Club, the Brockton Library Association, D.W. Field Park Association, Brockton Symphony Orchestra, Plymouth County Charter Commission, and as a Brockton Emergency Management Media Advisor. We are pleased to present the Charles A. Fuller Memorial Chamber Service Award to a true chamber champion and community leader, Bob Wisger. Thank you very much. Um, first of all, I am honored I'm very humbled, but more than proud of the Chamber, uh, the greatest organization in the world anyone can really belong to because I can't say anything negative about anything I've ever met through the Chamber of Commerce. It's all positive, positive, positive. Uh, 
Also very proud, actually one of the first meetings I went to was in 1968. I believe it was Stonehill College. And it consisted of about four round tables with maybe 10 or 12 people at the time. And that was a Good Morning Mento South. Today you go to a Good Morning Mento South, there's at least 150 people there. And look at today. Thank you very much. I'm very, very proud. Thank you very, very much, Bob, for everything. And now it is my pleasure to introduce our speaker, Ted Reinstein. Since 1995, Ted has been a reporter for Boston CVB TV's Chronicle, the nation's longest running locally produced nightly news magazine. He also provides reports and commentary on Sunday mornings for the station's political roundtable show, On the Record. His first book, New England Notebook, One Reporter, Six States, Uncommon Stories, was released in May 2013. This book recounts many of Ted's favorite people and stories from his travels all around New England. National Geographic Traveler named it one of its best picks, and the book is now in its second printing. In April 2016, Glow Pico Press released Ted's second book, Wicked Pissed, New England's Most Famous Feuds. His newest book, written in collaboration with his wife, Anne Marie, is New England's General Stores, Exploring an American Classic. And you know, as you think about that part of our lives, I don't know many of you, but growing up in Brockton, I will never forget the corner stores, whether it was Belmont Cash, BJ's, Fanny's Market, or White's Delicatessen, those are all memories that I'll never forget. So I'm sure all of you have some of these memories that really had a lasting impact. So with that, please join me in welcoming Ted. Thank you very much, Jerry. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, it is a pleasure to be back here to uh, speak to the Metro South Chamber. Um, and it's even more of a pleasure today because, you know, Jerry mentioned my first two books, but my most recent, I think, really resonates for all of us here today. Um, quick show of hands. How many of you either own, operate, manage, work for a small local business? A lot of folks, right. So this is about what I'm talking about today and sharing with you are the stories really about New England's very first, the original, the original small local business of New England, the general store. And it's also about something that I know is near and dear to all of you, really people everywhere. However much they realize it, however much they live it, however much they need it, and that's the sense of community. I spent the last year and a half prior to the books coming out in October researching and visiting and writing about America's really first original small local business, the general store. Now, they have been around a long time. The good ones, like in Putney, endure still. And you know, I was up in Vermont a couple of weeks ago and had a chance, and this will air on Chronicle next Monday night, but I had a chance to revisit four of the general stores that are in the book, and one of them is in Woodstock, Vermont. Anybody ever been to Gillingham's? Yeah. So Gillingham's has an interesting story that speaks so much to running a small local business and the need to innovate the need to pioneer, the need to try new things and not be stuck in the mud. Because F.H. Gillingham was not the original owner. F.H. Gillingham had a partner early on. And F.H. was the younger partner who had all kinds of crazy, fresh, new ideas. For instance, he wanted to the store to have a new slogan. Your money's worth or your money back. And people said to him, what, 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 what are you doing? I mean, what do you, what do you really give people's money back for something they bought for some reason? They just don't like it? And he said, yeah, I am. 
And it worked. It worked. He also believed in some, trying out something that, at the time, was a relatively new concept in large-scale form, and that was advertising. That was advertising. His partner felt that it was undignified. His partner felt, now this is 175 years ago, but his partner felt, that's akin to, you might as well walk around with a sandwich board up and down Main Street in Woodstock. But F.H. believed in it passionately, and if he had gone with his partner's inclination, then F.H. Gillingham might not be there today. So the question then is, why do general stores survive? Why are they necessary? Why do they have value at all? And you might be wondering, what the hell am I doing looking at a dodo bird? <laughs> well, the dodo bird is an example of an endangered species that was driven to extinction. This is an example of an endangered species that has not yet been driven to extinction. So is this. So, in terms of what drove the dodo bird to extinction, it was predators like these. And in terms of what has been driving general stores to the point that there are fewer and fewer left to survive, well, I will tell you that you may have consorted with this predator recently. I know I have. I mean, I can't hide it. I, mean, I think within the last 24 hours, actually. Right? Right. So, and they've taken casualties, for sure, the big boxes, the chain organizations, for which hard, small local businesses on Main Street, as you well know, all over New England, including in Brockton, it can be a tough challenge, right? And they've taken casualties, like, as Chris and I were talking about, uh, in the small village of Adamsville, of Little Compton, Rhode Island, Gray's, which closed in 2012 and was at that time the single oldest general store in America, 224 years. That's a hell of a run for a business. Right? That's only 10 years less than the country was in business. So I'm going to jump ahead a little bit here because we have limited time. I want to share with you kind of the nugget of what this is all about in terms of the interplay between commerce and community. So by the time you get to the mid last century, you have the explosion of the automobile. In 1960, you now have a majority of Americans for the very first time in history own an automobile. And that leads to even greater development and the rise of super communities in the suburbs and the exurbs where you can't even tell the difference anymore between the urban environment and the suburban environment, right? And people move into these wonderful new communities, boomers mostly, and they're wonderful. They have all the amenities they could ever imagine, wonderful infrastructure and great playing fields and school systems. They have their choice of three or four different drive through coffee shops on their way to work. And curiously, for a lot of people, by the time you get to the mid 70s and early 80s, something is missing from these wonderful, gold, wonderful, super new communities. And oddly, it's community. It's community. People start to have a sense that something is missing. You know, in 1971, Life magazine published a poll that a lot of people found very disturbing, and that was that over 60% of Americans said they had only sporadic interaction with their next door neighbor. That was unthinkable to earlier generations, and it was becoming the norm in America. So something was missing. Now you get in your car and get on that highway, and this choice is dwarfed by this choice. So what was missing? Well, a funny thing happened on the way to extinction. That's the central premise of my book and that I found out in my research. Because ironically, the very forces that threaten the general store with extinction end up being the same forces that help save them. How's that? Because the people who found in those communities that they were missing community, right? And while they may not have always been able to put their finger on what it was, it turns out that in the 1970s, a wonderful American sociologist named Ray Oldenburg at the University of Florida did. And perhaps you've heard, how many have heard of the, the notion of the third place in American life, right? So it sound, it's one of those things that sounds so disarmingly simple. You say, why didn't I think of that theory? Well, basically what he theorized was that we Americans, and really people largely all over the world, spend our lives in one of three places. We may think that we go on exotic travels, and, but really we spend our lives in one of three places. One, home, family, 
two, work, and three, a third place. The third place can be one of any number of types of places. It could be a place of worship. It could be a beauty shop, barber shop, cafe, diner. It could be a chamber of commerce meeting. It could be a library. It could be a general store. But what distinguishes the third place in American life is that unlike the first two places, it is a place where you know when you go there, you will be interacting with people from your community. And what he also found is that even though you are going to perform a certain task, to go to a meeting, to return a book, get a cup of coffee, quart of milk, that actually, unconsciously, you are also fulfilling a need, not buying the milk, but interacting with other people from your community. He found that this was actually a deep need for people. But as life became more fractured, diffuse, people working all kinds of jobs and moving around, the notion of community began to be fractured. But the need for it, Ray Oldenburg found, didn't go away. So what happens? A lot of people in those super communities become the first wave of folks who move out of suburbia and move to small towns all around New England, and they're really after one thing. They themselves are now beginning their own families, and they want more of a sense of community. And they move to these small towns, and they find in many of them there is this wonderful general store that is the heart, the beating heart of these communities. And when that general store, as so many of them did, around 2000, between 1995 and 2000, an astounding number of New England's general stores went up for sale. And in many cases, nobody wanted to come forward and buy one. And it became kind of this first vanguard of folks who had moved to these small towns just to find communities like this and now found the center of the community threatened, they became the vanguard of the first wave of people who begin to save New England's general stores. And that's during the 1980s. During the 1980s. And again, I'm going to skip ahead a little bit because it took a village, right? So it, originally it took a village. When somebody didn't come forward to buy the store, in towns like South Ackworth, New Hampshire, they found ways to come together as a community and buy the store as a community, which they did. It wasn't the only place, but it was one of the first places to come together. Now I can see you. It came together as a community to buy the store. My favorite, which I visited just two weeks ago, so I want to share it with you, is in North Shrewsbury, Vermont, Pierce's. Heart and soul of North Shrewsbury, Vermont for 170, 185 years. But in the 19, early 1990s, Marjorie Pierce, there she is. Marjorie Pierce, who was then in her early 90s, not in that picture, that was in the 70s. But as the time you get to the 90s, she's in her 90s. And frankly, she'd like a little time off. <laughs> you can't begrudge somebody who's 94 or wants to take a damn day off, right? The problem was there was nobody to back her up. There was no staff. There was no one else to run the store. She had to close it. She had to close it. And Marjorie Pierce, 95, born and bred in North Shrewsbury, Vermont, in the next year and a half, two years, encountered an emotion she never had felt before, guilt. She felt terrible that she had been forced to close the store. She felt awful every time she heard somebody talking about they missed the store so much. That was the center of the community. They don't see so-and-so anymore because the store is closed. So she sought out a wonderful New Englander, one of the best, Paul Bruhn. Paul Bruhn is the founder and executive director of the Preservation Trust of Vermont, which starts in Vermont, helping to preserve local histories, and now does that all across America. And mind you, they don't do it as an exercise in sentimentality and preserving nostalgia. They do it as a business venture. They show that history can also be economically viable. When you save the heart and soul of Main Street, you save a community. But the only way he knows that you're going to be able to sell that to the broader public is to show that they will pay their own freight, that these things make economic sense. This isn't about preserving nostalgia. And he has done that all across America, and he did it in Shrewsbury. Because Marjorie Pierce went to him and she said, Paul, I'm going to make you an offer. I have to reopen the store, but I can't do it myself. You're going to do it. 
I'm going to give you the stoa, and I'm going to give you $10,000, which is pretty much all the money I have, but I don't expect to need it too much longer. And he said, Marjorie, and if I know Paul, like I do, he is a soft-spoken, angelic kind of guy, and he must have taken her hand in his, and I'm sure he patted it and said to her softly, kindly, Marjorie, dear, it's not what we do. It's not what the PVT does. We help communities help themselves to hold on to their history. We mentor people. We mentor people. We fundraise. We help communities write grants and find funding. But we don't own property outright. And she said, Piffle. Well, as Paul relates the story, about a half an hour later, he was back in his car on his way up to Burlington and the Preservation Trust of Vermont owned its first property outright. <laughs> and he came down about two weeks later and he met with the local board that had formed around the store and he said, well, it's true, I'm holding the deed to the store, we own it, but we are not going to run it. And Pierce's became this wonderful story how average local people who have never run a business in their lives, who don't know a first thing about Business 101, if they were going to read anything about business, it was going to be business for dummies. They learned how to run a store, how to run a business. He mentored them. They fanned out to small general stores that had succeeded all over New England. They learned how to raise money in the community, how to buy inventory. And in, they opened the store. They completely rehabilitated it over five years of hard work. And in 2009, it reopened, and the beating heart of North Shrewsbury, Vermont, was in fact beating once again, and then Mother Nature had her say. Two years later, the worst natural disaster ever to hit the state of Vermont came roaring into the Green Mountains. By the time it reached Vermont, it was no longer a hurricane. It had been downgraded to a tropical storm, but that doesn't make much difference. When you're packing 68 mile an hour winds, what's the difference between 75 mile an hour winds? You're still going to sweep away. 200-year-old covered bridges like so much driftwood. And here's a curious back story, little sidebar, as they raised the money to open Pierce's, reopen Pierce's. At the very end, the board came to the community and they said, we need $5,000 more because we want to invest in a terrific generator. We want to be have an emergency generator because the feeling was if we are going to return to being the heart and soul of the community through thick and thin and the worst Vermont has to throw at us, the community needs to know that this is a place they can come and we will be up and running. And there was a lot of belly aching, a lot of grousing, and that first day that Irene hit, the lights went out all over Vermont, all over Vermont, including North Shrewsbury, except one little place. Because at Pierce's, the board trooped over to the store through the howling wind and rain. They fired up the emergency generator. The lights came on. And to hear folks up there tell it who were in the store that day, they said late afternoon as the, as the, the wind was just beginning to die down and the light was fading, she said it looked like something out of Night, like out of, night of the Living Dead. She said people were like, walking out of the trees and up the street to Pierce's where they found the lights on and the coffee was hot and the Wi-Fi was working and they were able to call and get in touch with family and let them know they were okay. And nobody has ever bellyached about that emergency generator again. Now, I'm going to share with you one more story that is an example. So we talked about how it takes a village some kind. Sometimes you have these wonderful New England General stores that not only have stood the test of time, They've never been up for sale, and they are so unique, like Dan and Witz in Norwich, Vermont, that they needed a chapter of their own, and they say something very, very, I think, significant about business in New England years ago. My favorite example is Hussey's. Looks like Hussey, but Harlan Hussey was a German immigrant. And uh, in Windsor, Maine, he presided over this wonderful general store. Didn't look like this in the late 50s. In the late 50s, Harlan expanded from his little one-story garage and he built this three-story, because there's a basement level, he built this three-story commercial colossus in Windsor, Maine. 
And what makes it unique, you know, you will find a sign in a lot of New England general stores, I'm sure you've seen it. If we don't have it, you don't need it, right? Mm. The difference with Huzzies is that it's actually true. Um, so read this sign starting at the, uh, at the bottom. There you are. Start at the bottom. Start at the bottom, All right? Wood stoves, home and garden, plumbing, electrical paint, hardware, camping gear, fishing, hunting supply, guns, bridal gowns, clothes, wait, what? <laughs> right, right. So Huzzies is the only general store in America where you can buy guns, gowns, and beer. <laughs> and sure enough, Harlan's, Harlan's great-granddaughter, Kristen, on her wedding day, had to demonstrate, and you know, she had to do this picture, and there's the lovely bride holding her bridal bouquet, a six-pack of Schlitz, and the groom is holding a brand new 12-gauge. So, as we finish, as we finish, I want to point out that none of these stores, none of these stores would survive today. Not the old ones, not the less than old ones, without a new breed of people committed to saving the general store. And it isn't just about saving the general store. This is a new breed of general store owners who see the value, the value, the place of a general store in New England, in places like Monterey and the Berkshires. Now somebody who walked in after Alex Cole, a restaurateur in Lenox, you know, if they walked in and they'd last been in the store 150 years ago, they would recognize the original pine wood floor, but they wouldn't necessarily recognize what the hell is a Calabrese salad at the counter. But that's what's keeping the Monterey General Store in business today. And there's a lesson there, and I'm sure it applies to any business you're involved with too. And that is, a general store has to serve the community that it's in. Not some, you know, nostalgic community from New England's past. And it's true of not just general stores. You know, I speak at a lot of libraries, and I'm very committed to public libraries. And public libraries today, curiously, face many of the same challenges as general stores. Right? Just like general stores, public libraries know that their potential users have many choices to do what one used to do at a library. They don't need the library. I don't need the library to go get a book. I get a Kindle, go online, whatever. That's why God invented Amazon. What's the problem? So libraries know today, the good ones, the savvy ones, the ones that will survive, they know that libraries are no longer about books. That's a funny little secret, but it's true. There'll still be books at libraries, but they're not about coming to a library to get a book. They are about added value. They are about fulfilling the needs of the community they are in. And what works for a largely immigrant community like East Boston, and to some extent Brockton, does not necessarily work in Wellesley, doesn't work the same way in North Adams or Pittsfield. You have to serve the community you're in, or you will not survive. And more, I would say, don't really deserve to, because it's about that interconnectivity, that connectivity. If you're not connected with the community and what your community needs, what's the point? That's why Monterey survives. That's why the new general store at the old Pittsfield general store survives because of two transplanted New Yorkers who realized that they could remake the store and do what Kevin Stiles loves best. He's a four-star rated Michelin gourmet chef, was in Manhattan at Le Parc, and now he does a special 18 limited seating dinner four nights a week in the back of a general store. That's what's keeping that store in business. In Whitefield, Maine, now granted, Ben Marcus and Taryn Marcus, they may look like the quintessential general store owners, but they had no interest in running a general store. Never once in their lives as agriculture students where they met in Washington, did they have that idea. They wanted to run a farm. They're farmers. Ben grew up in Whitefield, Maine. They came back there. They started looking fruitlessly for some land to buy to farm, and a fellow came up to them one day and he said, you know what, I know that you folks are interested in buying some land to farm. And I know that that may not happen here. However, I'm gonna make an offer. I will give you, I will give you three prime acres of farmland, but there's a catch. On that land, 
There is a derelict, defunct general store, Sheepskit General. Used to be the heart of this town, but it's long out of business. I've always dreamed of reopening it, but if you take over the farmland, you take over the store, reopen it, the land is yours. And they wrestled with it. They weren't business people. They didn't have any interest in it. They didn't know how that would work. They did hedge their bets. They decided to do it, but their plan was they would only buy inventory that they liked, and they would only buy food products that they would eat. Because the thought was, when this whole thing goes belly up, we can at least eat through the inventory ourselves. <laughs> Sounds like a good idea. But it didn't happen. Oh, the farmland worked. The farmland worked well. They started reaping wonderful fresh produce from the farm, and then they started thinking, you know what? Instead of breaking our butts every week, driving six, seven hundred miles a week to hit every farmer's market around New England, what if we could find a way to sell our produce at the farm as part of a wonderful cafe? And a local retired chef stepped forward to run it for them, and it took off, and now the Sheepskit General store is once again the centerpiece of the community in Whitefield, Maine. It's popular with young and with old. And for me, it's one of those examples that really gives hope, as does, how perfect, the reopening of Hope General in Hope, Maine, that the third place will remain alive and well. And again, I can't stress enough that it is all about community. It is all about community. It is about people needing community. And if you ever doubt it, remember Ray Oldenburg's theory of the third place. People need community. They don't, they don't just want it. They actually need it. So those businesses, libraries, general stores, that are able to add value to what they do, yes, it's running a business. Of course it is. But those businesses that I think, like the general stores that I researched, that have done best, that still flourish, that are thriving today, instead of having to close up shop, are those that realize they are part of that community. The more value they add to what that community needs, the more valuable they are as part of that community. It's true on Main Street, it's true in Maine, it's true in Brockton, and I think it's a wonderful truth to hold dear, because there really is nothing more important than community. And as I always point out, what is community, right? We think of our family as being most near and dear to us. Communities are just extended families. It is a group of families. So in a sense, it's all one. Thank you very much. Thank you.